Good afternoon. We will get started shortly. Thank you so much for joining us for the four alumni by alumni session today. We're going to give people a few more minutes to join in. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I'm Ron Delphine, Director of Alumni Relations and Career Services here at the Heinz College, and we're very excited for today's session. Before I start my introduction of our featured alumni speaker, I just want to tell you about a few new Heinz initiatives um, that, that we're currently involved with. On the heels of our very successful Executive Ed C-Suite offerings, we're pleased to announce the launch of two new programs. The CMU Chief Digital Officer, which is the C Digital O, and the Chief Data Officer, C Data O Certificate Programs. The C Digital O program, which begins this January, supports digital executives with how to develop and structure a digital organization and manage a growing portfolio of digital initiatives. The C Data O program, which will begin this March, provides current and future data executives with critical strategic insight, data management techniques, and analytical capabilities. We've seen a lot of interest in both of these programs and the seats are filling up quickly. Dave Ulichny is the point of contact for these programs, who's our Senior Director of Executive Education, and his contact information will be available in a follow-up email after this session. I also wanted to draw your attention to our Washington DC based MSIT Information Security Assurance Program. Once again, this program is based in Washington, DC and focuses on education, risk management, information security, and data privacy. The first cohort will begin fall of 2021. Okay, so welcome to our latest four alumni, by alumni workshop. If you have questions during the session, they can be submitted to the chat box and my colleague Georgette Hatfield will monitor monitor those questions and relay them to the panel during the Q&A session. Today, we're excited to have Ian Clue and a fantastic group of his colleagues here to discuss how the US Army is using data science in critical decisions and how your organization might adopt some of these practices. I'm gonna let Ian introduce the panel shortly, but first a bit about him. Ian earned his Bachelor of Business, Business Administration degree from the College of William & Mary before coming to the Heinz College where he earned his public policy degree in data analytics in 2014. After graduation, Ian became a presidential management fellow, which allowed him to work on data science projects throughout the DOD and the FBI. He's currently an instructor at the United States Military Academy, where he also continues to support the DOD. His research includes threat financial detection, record linkage, and sports analytics. And like me, Ian is from Pittsburgh and uh, we're both very excited that the Steelers are still undefeated after that game yesterday. And with that, I will turn it over to Ian so you can meet the rest of the panel. Thanks a lot, Ron. Let's go Steelers, let's go Pens. Uh, sorry, Matt. I don't know. I don't know if anyone else has any strong allegiances. I know we got some. I won't even say it. It'll, it'll sour the audience to you. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Ron. So this this uh, this is really fun. We were talking about doing something uh, on this by alumni for alumni thing in the summer, and uh, initially I was thinking uh, about um, like coming on here and giving my uh, like uneducated musings about data science and how it can be, you know, from from one guy's point of view how how this has worked and could work better in the DoD. But um, I had the thought. Why would I do that? You know, we have all these guys who know who know so much more uh, and have been doing this longer than me and have been have been doing it more successfully than me in a lot of cases. 
So uh, this panel group kind of represents um, not only a bunch of guys with CMU affiliations, actually everyone but Isaac on the panel um, did their PhD uh, at CMU in the last several years uh, with Kathleen Carley over in uh, societal computing. Uh, but everyone has some connection. So Isaac is, is currently working uh, at the AI task force doing some stuff with CMU. I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, but these guys really represent, like when I came into the Army's analytic community, these guys were sort of like the, the upper level like analysts um, who were the data science core back when calling it data science wasn't cool. Uh, and then uh, shortly after that, everybody kind of like progressed onto these other things. So went and earned PhDs and went and worked on research, went and did all these things, worked in these organizations. And now this, this sort of represents like the, the leadership core of data science in the army, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, and so I think, you know, if the army and the DOD hopes to do anything meaningful in the future with data science, hopefully at least a couple of these guys represent the future senior leader core uh, of the, the data science community as well in the army. So this is a pretty, this is a pretty cool panel. Um, so I'm gonna talk as little as possible about my opinions, although that's gonna be hard to do. Um, but I want to hear what these guys have to say. Cause they like, this is as much for the attendees here. I feel like this is for me. Like I really, anytime you can get this group of people together, it's rare. Uh, and it'll be, it'll be really awesome to hear. So just some quick introduction for everybody. And then let's get into, let's get into to talking about stuff. Um, so I'll just go in order of where I see you guys up there. So Ian Crookshank, uh, so Ian, I know Ian the least, uh, but uh, we've known each other like off and on for a bunch of years now. So that's just to say, I know these other guys really well. Um, but uh, yeah, so Ian did his uh, PhD with um, Kathleen Carley over in societal computing. He's now working over at the AI task force, which is located in Pittsburgh as well. Um, so he's either a Steelers fan or didn't get a better offer. We'll take it. Uh, Ian, I, I'm actually working with Ian on some, some research right now as well, uh, which is very cool. Uh, he, Ian represents uh, a really unique dude in the army. There's not a lot of people who have progressed through academia at the rate that Ian has done. Uh, and uh, it's sort of gives him a really unique take that anytime we've been able to grab a coffee or whatever at a conference, it's, it's been really informative. So looking forward to hearing what uh, Ian has to say. Um, Matt, Matt Benini is um, uh, the, he's the guy. He's, he's the guy in the, the special operations community right now who is doing data science. He's been tasked with uh, creating, essentially from the ground up, an organization uh, that is uh, pushing the boundaries of, of data science, uh, again, in the special operations community. So, um, yeah, what more to say? I've been doing a lot of research uh, with and for Matt for the last couple of years. And um, I think, especially when it comes to uh, talking about like building these organizations and, and trying out a couple of different things. I'm really excited to hear what uh, what he has to say about this. Uh, again, Matt did his PhD uh, with Kathleen Carley uh, working on uh, societal computing and uh, had some really, really fascinating research um, if you're interested in looking at uh, detecting net extremist networks. So um, that's actually kind of a common thread. A lot of us have, have put our toe in the water, but Matt has done way more than put his toe in the water. So check that out if it's interesting. So welcome and thank you so much for taking the time. This is like one of the busiest guys in the army as well. So this is awesome. Um, Dave, Dave is uh, uh, down at uh, the uh, uh, army cyber. You're down in Georgia now, right? That's right. Yep. Down in Augusta, Georgia. Augusta. And you, you don't golf, right? I, I need to, but not, not seems, enough. <laughs> seems like you should. I don't know. Or shoot something. They got quail down there. I'll come down and shoot some quail, uh, pretend like I know something about golf. Um, so Dave and I worked together for a really long time. I think, uh, I think I met Dave and Isaac like day two when I started uh, working for, for the Army in analytic capacity. So um, uh, we've been working on sort of like bottom up data science efforts for a really long time. Um, Dave also uh, worked on societal computing with Kathleen Carley, uh, just finished up last year. And he is, has been charged with taking an, uh, the cyber capability to the next level when it comes to data science for the army. And so, um, yeah, another, another like really interesting organizational look. Um, and I should mention for all of these guys, like uh, there's, a, there's this rotational aspect of the army that's not common in industry. So if you're not familiar with how the military works, um, 
all these guys have worked a number of, of jobs, both interesting and not interesting <laughs> throughout the DOD space. And so uh, I, it, there's, there's a cool perspective that'll come out. I could like, I could go through everybody's resume for like the entire time here. I'm gonna try not to do that. So uh, awesome to have Dave here. Oh, and also Dave, so I'm up at West Point now. Uh, all these guys have been at West Point in some capacity uh, and uh, Dave's hopefully coming back. So um, we, can, we can talk about that sort of educational front maybe at some point. Uh, when it comes to like building the next generation. And then um, Isaac is, uh, he's our one guy who didn't, doesn't have some sort of degree that has CMU on it, but uh, he's far from, he's far from an imposter. He went to, to a small school uh, called Stanford that I've, I've heard of several times. So uh, he's, he's pretty legit. That's what I've heard at least. Um, he's working at the AI task force, running the show over there. Um, if, if you if you do anything that has to do with data science on the internet, you probably already run into Isaac. You just don't know it yet. Uh, he's like, he's a big deal over there at LinkedIn. Um, and uh, he has always got an effort going that is like two levels beyond uh, what I would have thought. So um, it, I'm really curious to hear, especially when it comes to infrastructure, Isaac's done a lot of uh, really interesting work on uh, data science infrastructure to support data science teams and has continued that in his, his most recent post. So uh, really looking forward to hearing all that stuff as well. Did I miss anything important? Hopefully, oh. okay, it's communicated. These guys are awesome. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about, let's, let's do some nerd stuff. Let's talk about data science. Um, so the, the thing that I think is, uh, perplexing to the army right now that I, I don't think that anyone has a really good answer for, but I bet you guys have opinions on is where the data science capability should fit. So uh, what I mean by that is like, if you look around the intelligence community, you can see that uh, data science is sometimes shelved off into like an R and D functionality. Sometimes the idea is to have a centralized group of data scientists that you can come to with your questions. Other places it's like, let's just sprinkle these, these data, data nerds out into the, analyst population and see what we can do. Um, I'm curious to hear, uh, Matt, let's start with you. Let's, let's, I know that you've sort of tried a bunch of these different strategies. What, what have you found to be successful or is it, is it dependent on the use case or what do you think? Yes, well, I always try and be careful and, and kind of narrow my statements uh, to, to, to not claim they're generalizable, right? Um, so we definitely started from the grassroots side of things in the special operations community uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, we really were starting to see our deployed special operators, their ability to make data informed decisions was that the constraint was manual information management processes. So um, we focused on, you know, where the operational pain points are, uh, and, and I think what we're starting to see is that by doing that, we've kind of caught the attention um, of both analysts, users, and leaders. So the, the, the understanding of the cost of the status quo is much more broad at this point. So operational leaders are willing to invest the time and the leadership emphasis to get more um, modern information management practices that open up opportunities for more advanced analytics. So I think over time, we're starting to use more advanced workflows more routinely now, um, in part because we've helped kind of um, motivate growth in terms of digital literacy. Interesting. Yeah. So that, yeah, if you build it, they'll come kind of works, but we, we built a lot of cool stuff and nobody showed up for a long time. I think it's hard to, to gain momentum when you're focusing on abstract problems. I mean, I get that for modernization, you really have to do that. But to transform the force to be ready uh, to be AI enabled 10 years from now, we need to, you know, not be using Excel and, and Outlook as our primary information management tools. Absolutely, yeah. Dave, what, what's it been like down in Georgia since you got down there? I know that's a, 
it's kind of an environment that you didn't get to to choose what the team structure looks like, but how's it how's it going? Yeah, it's a great question in context of this. I, I would say um, we hit the ground. There's a lot of great initiatives down here already where there's there's already some centralized things moving to not only develop the data science, but I would say developers in general, software engineers and others. There's a, there's a culture to try to develop that within the force um, that we kind of fell in on. And so um, to, to a degree, we're trying to develop, I think, a hybrid model where you have some centralization so you can create the, the kind of the norms, the cultures, the policy, the environment, and, and try to dictate some of that. So we're not we're not just having a gazillion GitLab instances all over our enterprise where no one has visibility, where we're all, all working on the same problem, writing the same code over and over again. So there has to be some centralization to create that continuity. At the same time, just like uh, Matt said, we do have to have the decentralized folks that are down on the ground with operators to understand what are the real problems. Um, and so right now, uh, uh, to, and to be able to see where the right data is, and then once we do create a solution to help make sure that solution is right and gets traction within, within the force. Um, so right now we are really focused on the centralization and getting some things done. And, and I think we're trying to move more into getting the decentralized folks kind of, kind of forward into the foxhole with analysts to really understand what their problems are as they work through cyber workflows, potentially particularly on um, you know, defending our networks against uh, an, uh, an able adversary. Yeah, that's interesting. So Isaac, what do you think from like, you're in an organization that could be classified as like, it is the centralized, or at least like it's a separated off organization that has a data science mission. Uh, I don't know, we could call AI like a subset of data science or vice versa, I guess. No, I think the first one. But anyway, how have you found that to be like, is it, are you guys breaking off uh, bigger like infrastructure problems? Or are you breaking off uh, specific data challenges? Like what is it looking like? Yeah, so specifically within the task force, so um, a little bit of context for for everybody that isn't isn't familiar. So I'm the chief data scientist at the artificial intelligence task force within the army, uh, and we have this special relationship with Carnegie Mellon, um, where a lot of the projects that we do uh, that are on that 10 year horizon that Matt just mentioned uh, in terms of providing AI enabled capabilities down the road. So a lot of the stuff that we're doing in the first couple of years is uh, me personally, uh, that I'm working in terms of project management or some of those plumbing problems, a little bit like what Dave mentioned too, like how do we make sure that the folks who are doing data science uh, and AI as a subset have access to all of the right tooling and all of the right data. Uh, so one other thing that's useful, I think, to, to provide a little bit of context uh, as well is how the DOD works at a really high level with employing people. So generally, if you get involved with the DOD, you'll run into one of three types of people. Like the, uh, the classic, obviously, is the soldier, someone who wears a uniform. Uh, then we have a complement uh, of civilians, that's like Ian, who are you know, actual government employees. And then we actually have a really large contract workforce. Uh, and those are folks who are hired to do specific jobs uh, on contract. The contract workforce at some points in time uh, is larger than the other two uh, bodies of people, uh, sometimes by a couple orders of magnitude, depending on where you're at. Uh, and what used to be the case was anytime we did something technical that had to do with software or IT, it almost always went to that contract workforce that we would hire people out to do those sorts of things. And the issue is, is that uh, while you can hire people in a short period of time that have talent, it's usually ephemeral. So they would build a solution and leave and um, it would be difficult to maintain. Um, or if you didn't stay with a particular company, it would mean you'd have to build things uh, over again from scratch. And we have this issue called vendor lock-in where you, know, you can only work with one company that uh, offers one particular product. And so that put the DOD behind the power curve uh, in a significant way in terms of being able to adopt a lot of things on the edge like we had been able to do uh, you know, historically. And so a lot of what's happening with this panel right now is you're talking with people who, are, who have organically developed uh, data science and AI capability inside of the uniformed population, the actual soldiers who deploy and uh, provide solutions. And what we found is, is that that's the population that's concerned with these operational considerations like how do these technologies actually work in a stable way so that a soldier who's you know responding to a natural disaster or is deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan can not just use one of these tools but actually build something that's relevant to a mission and turn it around quickly uh, and that all involves you know deep knowledge with how software is built and how you do data science capabilities and so at the task force to answer Ian's specific question that's what we're trying to do is how do we enable our our resident workforce, our civilians and our 
uniformed members to have not just those talents, but also those uh, those development environments, those capabilities to deploy uh, systems where most of the legacy of the way these systems were built uh, were intended to be done by contractors. And so they're covered with huge amounts of bureaucratic red tape to ensure that, uh, you know, we avoid things that typically come from uh, hiring out, hiring out positions. So turning that sort of paradigm on its head in terms of, you know, how do we organize people? How do we develop teams? How do those teams then complement uh, mission sets? Uh, you know, all of those have infrastructure impl implications. You know, how do we make the cloud available to a low level commander? Like we'd never, you know, we've never done anything like that before in the past because it was usually just taken care of by, uh, by a contractor. And so those are the questions that I think are at least at the front of my mind and uh, in what we're doing at the task force and specifically around collaborative environments. How do we take this literally globally distributed workforce that has people that are buried deep down into a tactical environment all the way up to you know working at the pentagon trying to do budget things for five years across you know billion dollar portfolios and you know that's a pretty broad range of, of people and with the right tooling and the right collaboration systems uh, they can bring to bear lots of different sorts of data science capabilities in in the near term that are responsive to the commanders and what they need and so at least that's what I see as uh, the enabling thing. We have this moniker in the DOD or Army specifically, right? Like that, if you're going to do something, you have to you have to man, train, and equip. That is, that you have to hire the right people. You've got to give them the tools that they need for that mission, uh, and then you've got to provide some sort of training pipeline. So, actually, at Carnegie Mellon, at the Heinz Institute, uh, we have ten people who started master's programs last year in what we're calling the AI Scholars Program. So. It's one of the things the task force has put together that's in that pipeline of like, you know, how are we going to train these people? And then the equipping piece is no kidding, like what website do they log into to get access to data and tools, which you may be shocked <laughs> to hear how we actually do that today. Um, and is very much uh, like this panel, if we all have one attribute, it's that we are excellent hackers of the DOD network and can get software put on systems that isn't technically allowed to be put on it so that we can actually accomplish this mission. So sort of solving those problems are at the forefront of what at least I'm working on at the task force. Hopefully that answered the question. It did. That's phenomenal. Um, so I'm interested in the, in the, in the people part. Um, let's talk about the people part. So like my, my sort of like takeaway from my first several years of working in like the, the army and DOD analytic communities is just that we've tried to solve um, analytic problems by buying stuff by buying software in the past and that's even come by contractors so the vendor lock i think is an example of that you know if your contract ends in a vendor lock database you didn't contract for services you contracted for a product um and it's not really working very well uh to you know i can't tell you i mean I, i'm sure of the attendees here too i mean if you go to any any of these conferences uh, you'll see a lot of presentations about how tableau is going to change the world and uh you know, why am I shouting out Tableau specifically? I'll, I'll throw those under the bus. Jump is another one, right? Like you see all these presentations for people who are are promising you that what you need is this one piece of software. And, you know, um, back to Matt's point, like I, we got to get our ourselves out of this Excel paradigm. Um, and like the way to do it isn't to find a new Excel. The way to do it is to have people with capability. But I don't, I don't know what that necessarily means. I have some ideas. <laughs> But I don't know, and I'm a little bit curious how, like, so we have a pretty interesting representation here, especially with with Matt and Dave, of um, the like different levels of bureaucracy that exist. So I'd say Dave's on the high end of the bureaucracy, and then Matt has a little bit more freedom to to maneuver when it comes to personnel and hiring. Um, so I, I want to hear from those guys about their organizations and how this you've attempted to solve this people problem. But I actually first I think it would be interesting to hear from Ian, like you you are sort of the prototype guy, right? Like if we could do everything right, I think we get an army of Ian's, but do we need an army of Ian's? Can you answer that as an Ian? Yeah, well, yes and no. Um, <laughs> so I'm by far the youngest guy and probably the least successful in this panel as well. Um, what I would say is no, you don't need a bunch of research quality folks to get data science moving throughout an organization. As, as like Lieutenant Colonel Besco kind of brought up, right? There's this interplay between having centralized and then people at the edge. And so you, you don't need 
to build a whole bunch of PhD researchers to be able to have data science throughout your organization. A lot of problems, especially if you can get things like Lieutenant Colonel Faber's been working on with the tools, get them the proper equipment. Folks with an undergrad or a master's degree, especially if they have some good mentorship within the organization, can really attack a heck of a lot of problems, especially down on those lower levels. So yeah, while I appreciate, you know, I am unusual from that sense, I don't, I don't think you really, we necessarily have to just have the most expertise in all of our people, but really more of a culture that encourages this across a lot of levels and ranks. That makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. So yeah, Matt, maybe you can talk about how we how we would utilize that, like and how you have how you've approached it in your organization. Like how how many Ians do you need? A, a couple. Um, so so just for the audience, my work is usually in support of deployed special ops forces. So usually in the intelligence arena. So so that discipline uh, in its own right is highly technical. Um, you know, I, I oftentimes get to go to a deployed environment and kind of sit alongside the analyst. And when I see a senior intelligence analyst start coaching junior analysts, you know, my conclusion is if I wanted to be a good intel analyst, I needed to start like five years ago. Um, so the, the challenge is, as we start to support those analysts with, with analytics, we use an iterative approach because usually the, the things we start to surface as data scientists, um, once we give an analyst a result, they'll kind of inform us how their tradecraft could better inform the algorithm. And, and over time, we start to learn how to speak one another's languages. And I, and I just give that context in that I have not come across very many uh, cookie cutter supervised learning implementations where I just go execute my five-fold cross-validation, check out an F1 score and, and spike the football. Um, in the wild, it's we can find clever ways to um, you know, heuristically generate labels oftentimes, but how we measure model performance or interpret results is, is a really nuanced thing. And I think having someone uh, within arm's reach for the deployed data scientist that the deployed data scientist needs to understand when they're kind of in over their head in terms of model evaluation and be able to reach out. So that's an important thing to be able to train. Um, and then you need, you need a handful of Ians um, that, that are close enough to the problem that it's not a cold start when you, when you try and ask for help. Um, so that, that, more than we think, I, I would aspire to an army of Ian's, but I'm not sure we can scale that. Um, <laughs> but, but we got to think about how we keep them connected to, to some of those more complex problem spaces. So for your, for your, um, since, since, yeah. So I guess for, yeah, for the attendees, like, uh, the organization that Matt is in has a little bit more freedom in terms of bringing in talent, um. I've noticed it's been it's skewed a little bit more towards um, bringing people in uh, less like a little bit of a shift from contractor to civilian and military, maybe not as much military, but um, I guess I'm curious what like, is that a culture move? Is that a, is that, does that have to do with, um, is that just some, some mundane bureaucratic issue or like, is that, is that something that you think would, would make sense in other, like, like for Dave's organization, for example? I think if, well, one, it's a great sign that all of us know each other, right? So the work Isaac is doing to remove friction from our ability to, to put an analytic in front of an end user is, is important. Uh, there's, a, there's a large population out there where if, that want to use their data science skills for good, right? So, I mean, like we've got, um, an individual who's coming into our team now that's uh, his undergrads, computer science and math from MIT, did a few years in Silicon Valley and is getting his applied statistics degree from Oxford, um, but wants to work on cool problems. We've got an environment where we can get him close to cool problems. So he's taken like a 30% pay cut 
to come do three years in government. We've got a couple examples of folks like that. So I think um, in, in some ways, if you build it, they will come, right? So if, if the army can invest in making a problem solving environment where folks can realistically come on board in a reasonable amount of timeline and, and the, some of those bureaucracy hurdles are, are, are maybe knocked down, um, and, and serve with their expertise, I, I think there's a lot of people willing to do it. Have you found all that to be, Dave? Is it uh, tougher down there? Well, I think a lot of the things are the similar and a few things are different. Well, I think the one big thing is different is because of the nature of cyber, it's a little bit more centralized. Um, you know, we don't necessarily need to deploy all the time to check the network. We can, we can check it remotely and we can, you know, bring a lot of things together. So it's slightly different because of that. Um, so it, it's kind of the backdrop. I've just hit the ground here coming out of Carnegie Mellon this summer. Um, and it's kind of taken over as the, the, the DevSecOps lead in the Army Cyber Headquarters. I'm covering down on both data science and dev, which is an interesting relationship. And we still see some conflicts between, there's a cultural conflict between computer science and math sometimes. And I, I'm, that's tangible for me on a daily basis. Um, so uh, it's, 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 it's been going, as far as the people, I've been pleasantly surprised as I hit the ground. There was already some um, things developed or we're trying to bring this type of um, capability into the cyber force. In fact, three or four weeks ago, we just opened up a new MOS called 17 Delta in which we have, um, it's a, it's a it's sort of a cyber developer. Um, and, and within that is both the computer science and the data science parts of that, in which as they go through a very um, clear training and certification process called the, what we call the joint qualification um, process. And, and they test out of these things and they can incur additional pay. So even though we can't quite Come, we're still not close to a Silicon Valley paycheck. Um, it, it is still significantly um, higher what we're able to pay these folks as they get qualified at what we call the basic senior and um, master level. And so essentially they come in at the basic level and they have a, a six month process where they spend in six months just doing certifications uh, that they commit to a Git repository. And they have a senior mentor who's evaluating how they can do at, at basically showing that they are a very, very competent computer scientist. And then at the master level, um, and the basic level is all the same. Once they go to the senior level, there's about five different branches they can go into have to have different branches. And one of those branches is data science, and it's the most popular branch right now. And so they can get, and it takes us a, a, another year and a half then to get qualified at, at a senior level with a data science specialization. And there's, there's a handful of other cyber specializations that they can, they can specialize into. And so this has been going on for about four to five years and is now just getting traction where the, the MOS is getting rolled out. Um, we have a number of already certified folks who are extremely competent and, and we're trying to figure out how, now that we have them, how to synchronize them. So my two tasks as I hit the ground here is one, to, having a small team at the headquarters to develop enterprise development and particularly data science development, in particular um, centered around our data lake, um, which is which is really created by Isaac about three years ago when he was at Army, Army Cyber. So we're really trying to build apps that help um, get value out of a, a really great data, uh, big data lake or a, a, you know, a, a, a platform that we have. And then the second thing I've been asked to do is synchronize. So now that we have these developers spread across six score organizations in the cyber, they're all spinning up GitLab instances all over the place. They have different policies of where they can do what, when, what their environment looks like. I've been tasked to kind of synchronize that and help get us all on and common policies, common environments, common um, places and understanding of what can be shared within government, what can be shared with the commercial sector and all of that to try to synchronize that. And so. I think we're moving in the right direction. We have some very talented folks that are coming in, particularly um, both the data science and ORSA tracks, but especially through this new 70 and Delta series and is attracting, um, just like Matt, we have some very fun problems. And because of that, um, people are willing to take a pay cut to come in. And then the final thing I'll just say that we're able to leverage in a somewhat flexible way is the Army has just decided to, to work a direct commissioning. Um, well, we, uh, I've sat on a direct commissioning board for cyber now, and we, we evaluate some very technical talent coming out of both Silicon Valley and other organizations, all the way up to CEO level, where we can kind of laterally 
promote people into the officer corps up to the rank of a full board colonel or what we call an, an, an 06. And so we've sat on some boards and had some very technical folks that we are evaluating and bringing into the cyber force laterally into the rank structure in the officer rank structure. And, and we've seen some folks we're bringing in, uh, I, I think they'll be coming in at the 05 level, um, which I think is given us some flexibility to, to bring in some, some quality talent um, into the government positions, give them some tough problems and help them uh, tackle some of these, these problems that we have. So hope that answers your question there, Ian. Really does, that's awesome. And put me in coach, give me a call on that. Uh, the, I, I think that's really interesting like this. So like, I guess Isaac, maybe you could talk about this from your efforts to like bring together this community. Um, we, uh, a, a project that we started a long time ago was uh, we called DISCO, the Data Science Center of Education. It was an acronym before it was anything else, I think, because we like the disco ball uh, that we had built for us. Um, anyway, so it was, it was this idea to bring together all of the nerds into one place. And uh, we used to hold these events regularly, the Disco Infernos, where we would show a bunch of stuff that we were working on. And uh, uh, and aside on that, Dave, that um, you spun up a website at some point and put some Disco Inferno content on it. And uh, I just got a question from someone doing a record linkage PhD, like, hey, can you expand on this tutorial you posted out here? Uh, and I was like, well, I certainly didn't post it anywhere, but it was, <laughs> it was just floating out there. It was pretty incomplete, uh, somewhat embarrassing, but... Uh, uh, nice that's nice that the work's getting out um so disco has these broad reaching uh tendrils but uh I, my question is really like this community is clearly out there and i don't think that the people are in jobs where they call themselves data scientists sometimes they don't even call themselves analysts i don't know what necessarily they call themselves but it sounds like these people and every time we go to a conference we talk about something like this in the, the dod space like we get people coming up and they're like hey you know i've been working on data camp and i've been working you know i do kaggle competitions or whatever um do we have a hiring problem uh, from your view or do we have like a, a development problem? Do we just have to connect the dots here or do we, do we need more dots to connect? So I have said for a while to anybody who's listened that I, I think we have a very significant data science workforce already resident in the DOD in the uniformed and civilian population. I think depending on how you draw the box around what you would consider somebody who's data science capable, it's probably about a thousand people. You know, and that's that size of that workforce rivals uh, anything that you would find in Silicon Valley and even any of the big tech companies that it's specifically hired for these positions. So tons of people that come from our military academies with advanced degrees, tons of people that come from civilian institutions, from officer corps, people like Ian, right, who come from places like the Heinz College. Uh, the reason why we keep stumbling across these people is because they exist, right? And, and the issue is, is that they're not empowered organizationally. And so... I think that's an important consideration on a panel like this to say like, you know, when you mentioned something like Disco, so Disco is kind of like, imagine a homegrown GitHub, if you're familiar with that way. Everybody started producing these things at a grassroots level without any direction from senior leadership. And the DOD is a, is a multi-million person organization. It's enormous, right? And so without like high level, hey, the Secretary of Defense is interested in data science, it requires like grassroots, like people who see that these things can provide value to produce them. So this grew organically from the bottom up, of basically saying we need a way to collaborate and to share. Uh, and you know, there's lots of problems to there's lots of problems to solve. But I do not think the talent is one of them. I think we have enormous amounts of talent. I don't I just don't think it's formalized. So I I like to say that I think we have a, a data science militia in the army, right? We have a, a group of people who have built their own muskets have trained themselves uh, and are super motivated to accomplish things, but aren't necessarily empowered to do it. So it's always a surprise to a commander when they turn around and have access to some you know, data science artifact that they didn't even know could be produced using uh, using Excel, for example, or some of, the, some of the capabilities that we have of people that can use Excel in ways that I didn't know was even possible because it was the only tool that they had, but they were motivated to, to accomplish these things. So I, I don't think the question is necessarily talent. I think like, Dave is saying we have lots of pretty impressive people in the right places. Um, the question is, how do we connect them to our mission set? And, you know, our mission set, is, I think, is what's kept most of the people on this panel around. Like, when we say cool projects, I mean, it's no kidding. Like, we work on projects that make the news, right? It's, it's a very cool place to be. And, you know, even if you're, you know, if you want to work on logistics and that's your thing, you won't find bigger, more relevant logistics problems than you will in the DOD, 
right? It's not just you know, cyber special operations and intelligence. Like uh, we, you know, our mission set is, is awesome. We just have a horrible system to allow people to actually work and be impactful in those in many of those mission sets. We've clearly solved it or are in the process of solving it in different areas where we're data rich, but enterprise wide being part of this like grassroots evolution and now seeing it take hold, right? Like a lot of the things that we said early on uh, are now starting to, I'm seeing coming out of our, you know, the most senior C-suite equivalent folks uh, on a daily basis. I, I'd like to tell uh, a couple of people that I work with here at the task force that you know you're being successful when you see your slides uh, completely copied and put and used in someone else's presentation, right? Like plagiarism is a, like a benefit, you know, that you're actually uh, creating some strategic messaging, messaging when that happens. And I think now on a weekly basis, I see three or four slide decks, um, which by the way, is how we strategically communicate in the Department of Defense with PowerPoint, if you're not familiar with that. Uh, and I see them with cut and paste versions of my slides. And it's like the happiest thing that I could see happening. I'm like, hey, that, that went to the Secretary of the Army. Uh, you know, we don't need credit for it, but I clearly made that bubble chart. Uh, and it's landing, right? And so we're at the point now where that's starting to bubble up. And I think uh, to sort of put a bow on the answer to this question, I think it has to do with organizational change in terms of the way that we empower people to do the, the project. So they're not individuals. Uh, data science is a team sport, just like software development is. You have people with a range of capabilities. That's why you only need a couple of e, uh, you know, ENs, but you do need a, you know, a few folks that uh, are less uh, are less educated and aren't as expensive to bring on. And those people work together to build products, right? When, uh, and if that's the case, that means you need an organization that has positions specifically slotted for those teams to be created and led, depending on what the mission is. It could be as small as a three-person team in a tactical environment or as big as a 40-person team uh, in machine learning operations uh, division working on large-scale computer vision projects. So we don't organically have those teams built except for a handful of places you know what matt and dave are at are unique in the army my hope is what we're doing in the task force will encourage those pockets of organizations to be formally codified uh, army-wide or dod-wide then these people who we have will have a home to go to uh, and equipment to work on yeah that's awesome First off, just start making those Zeringen slides and then no one can figure out how to host them anywhere. Uh, you'll never have an issue. Um, <laughs> but but uh, you know, that's, that's very interesting. I mean, I, yeah, I, it's funny. That seems like people are out there. You just, you kind of say data science and people come running. Um, though it was funny, like when I feel like even when I started, it was cyber, you said cyber and everyone came running and then you said data science and now you say AI. Uh, at some point you could have said machine learning. I don't know. Now I think if you shout, I, I, the, the thing that, I just want to point out, I want to pat us on the back because no one has said uh, the word neural network at all in this talk. Um, it, when I feel like when I started, it was Hadoop. Like you couldn't go to a data science cycle without someone throwing out Hadoop to make it look like they knew what they were talking about. So for the, all the attendees, I think that's evidence that these guys actually know what they're talking about. No one felt the need to say the word neural network to try to, try to appear, <laughs> appear to know what they're talking about. Um, Anyway, I have a whole list of things that I, I think people shouldn't say in data science uh, or like there are canaries in the coal mine to know that you shouldn't listen to this person about data science and repeating buzzwords is one of them. So thank you all for not doing that. I think we'll jump to questions in a minute here, but I, I, I very briefly want to hit. So we've talked about people, we've talked about tooling. Uh, I want to talk about um, like management paradigms a little bit. And uh, it's a loaded question because I've been working on one of Matt's teams. Like I had a scrum meeting this morning, so I have thoughts, but I'm curious um, if, if anyone has had experience with like the agile methodologies, which is very popular for uh, software development and a lot of people who are calling themselves data scientists, not to say they aren't, but a lot of people who have like made it over into this data science space come from that software development place, or at least are like interested in it. And so I've seen this sort of like agile thing take off quite a bit. Even here at West Point, we run our cadet capstone teams. It's very popular to do those as scrum teams now. Um, is that paradigm, sufficient it's does it work well for data science does it need to be modified are we are we looking for something new or is this is this the way of the future and for i guess anyone can answer that who's who's kind of used it but i know i just talked about definitely counterpoint i do not think that agile is a perfect fit for data science machine learning ai 
type applications. Um, I think it's amazing for software development. And so the big, the big difference is, is that in software development, you have typically a pretty well uh, understood purpose of your product and the mechanism to produce that product is perfectly determinate. You know, you just need to write the code. And you need to test the code. And it's going to accomplish the thing. Uh, I've seen not so much in the DOD settings, but in a couple of other experiences I've had that it just, it, it's sort of misapplied. You have these you know, daily standups and progress just isn't linear when you're working on a data science project. I, I view it a lot more closely as like a systems analysis type project. You know, it's more like an investigation discovery. Uh, and then there's a point in time where you need to build a solution, but it's usually only a, a portion of the project. So I, I, I feel like there's some theory that hasn't been invented, like what's the best way to actually manage and do a data science project. And, and I don't think Agile is a perfect overlap. It forces software development practices onto a, a process that's not as linear as software development. And it's, it's my two cents. Maybe feel free to disagree with me. I think the build off that, what I've seen as I hit the ground here, and I, I kind of alluded to when I mentioned there's this, this um, tangible tension between computer science and mathematics, data science backgrounds. But um, part of how that comes out is, is while Agile has been great when we have a, when we're oriented on a product, it's not as good when we're trying to orient on a problem. And, and even as I lead as a data science background, but all my developers come from very much a, a software engineering, computer science, IT background. Um, there's a couple of times when we've been giving um, a challenge that, that it, you know, we need to solve a problem and not necessarily just create a product that's very really clear to find. And they struggle with that, uh, that data science, and it doesn't fit neatly into the software engineering coming up with timelines and, and very clear metrics of, of what success looks like and, and where we are at the end of a sprint. Because um, much of it's, you know, much of data science, sometimes it's just, just this exploratory data analysis that, that Isaac alluded to. And, and that's where a lot of the value will come in solving the problem is just this initial exploration time. And um, I think some of my computer science background, developer background, software engineering struggle um, with, with that part of, of solving a problem when it's not a very clearly defined product that we're working on. Well, I'll offer the one counter perspective, but, I, but I'll say I, I firmly agree um, with everything Isaac and Dave have said. Um, the, with a, a caveat here, so like I grew up in a leadership culture in the Army where you get told to do about 150% of the things that you have time to do, and you just end up doing the ones that are most important, and no one ever asks you about the crap you didn't get to. Um, and that's kind of the culture. We just never say no. Um, and to discipline myself against having my data science and development teams perpetually context shift, we implemented Agile. So anytime us as leaders say, hey, can you, can you add this into the workflow, <laughs> right? It, um, that idea of limiting work in progress ha has been helpful. The other thing that was a challenge for us, still is, but we're getting better at it. So I, I've got a handful of data science teams that all have kind of like specific customers. And there's a lot of overlap in what they do. And, and, and we aspire toward this like shared code base that allows all of them to, to run faster. But, but getting them as teams to slow down enough to understand what their kind of sister and brother elements are doing was challenging for a while. We found that getting on a cadence with Agile um, and kind of similar to what I read about Google, dedicating a certain percentage of time strictly to the task of knowledge sharing, kind of like Disco. We've got an internal Disco page uh, on the TS network for our team, um, that, that that's allowed us to start to produce things that are reusable by others uh, as we kind of grow our dev principles a little bit more. So um, all that said, you know, I don't, I don't scrutinize burn down charts, right? Like I, I recognize that this is problem solving is at the heart of what we're trying to do. And most of us perpetually underestimate how long it's going to take to solve a problem. 
Absolutely. I, I would say as a, as a member of one of the teams uh, that Matt was talking about from external uh, research side, so I play a very small role compared to the people who are there full time, but um, I was skeptical about the role of uh, Scrum or how, how valuable it could be in a data science team. And there are definitely, we have found ourselves uh, with some friction against the, the rails that don't conform very well. Um, but I do think that it is a focusing tool that has worked very well. It's almost like we're shaping it to, to be this, this new thing. Like it's almost like we're starting with Scrum and kind of like pushing towards some new thing, like, like Isaac was mentioning. I think though that there is like, there is like a, some space out there for the data science management paradigm that doesn't yet exist. Uh, and it might be close to Scrum, um, but currently it's, it's, it's not a bad place to start, I guess I'll say from anecdotal experience. Yeah, Isaac's definitely the most well-versed in this kind of thing, but it seems like many of our best practices that are becoming established as a community of practitioners are the point of departure in many cases is professional development practices, right? And especially as we start getting into teams where we're truly pushing things into production, it, it wanders towards that. Um, so, I mean, it's still a relatively young field and new roles are emerging and new titles and machine learning engineer versus data scientist. And so it's, it's still, the, the concrete's wet. Um, but I think anything that works well in the, in the dev community, uh, I try to understand it in its native form before trying to figure out how, how we adopt, you know, depart from it. Absolutely. All right, I think we should jump to, to some questions now. Uh, I, I probably waited too long to do that, but that was interesting. Uh, really awesome to hear that stuff. So let's, let's jump into some questions. All right, um, we have a lot of great questions, um, but one right off the bat says, from the business sector, we also require a lot of ground level heuristic feedback in order for our advanced analyses to earn use and traction. Beyond fit of models, what successes have you had in selling your learnings to the people who can leverage them? Anyone feel convicted? Uh, you have one or a couple anecdotes. So we found a lot of art robotic process automation type workflows as as a means to uh, kind of build heuristics at the user level, gain access to heuristics that we can then subsequently uh, provide more, more advanced analytics to help our user at the edge. So we've, we've kind of used giving them time back and getting repetitive tasks off their plate um, as a means to then kind of earn the right to show them how analytics can, can maybe help them focus on more important things to make sense of. Yeah, that's a great answer. And piggyback on that, Matt, I think that uh, one thing that I learned early on, the first operational analytics I've ever built was uh, in the cyber community. And I realized how easy it was to build a tool that gives somebody more work. And I realized if you do that, nobody will use your tool. Right. And so if your first effort isn't focused on making somebody's life easier, which often requires a first step of automating a, a boring thing that they do every day, they're not going to take your, uh, your advanced work. So there's a very practical cost benefit to that process. I think it's important to understand. Yeah, agreed. That automation piece has always been the, has always been the foot in the door. Great. All right, we have another great question. It says, what comes first, recognizing the need for organizational transformation or the analysis that induces change? And how do you navigate the solution through politics? That's a think, yeah, these are, these are like thinker questions. I got to, I gotta write you a paper on that one. I don't know. I, I think that um, 
I think that it hasn't always been, it hasn't been easy. I mean, to negotiate these sort of like political hurdles of driving this change. We, but like, kind of like we've been talking about here, the, the group that's represented here is, is the group that started at the bottom. Like, you know, it's a, the, the military, the DOD, it's all a very strange organization. Um, and there's a lot of lateral movement that's not typical. And I think too many other organizations, like, I mean, I, my resume looks like I've been fired from a lot of jobs, but it's really that I hopped around until I could find somewhere where I could gain traction and, and both from an analytic and also like sort of a political, if you want to call it that, right? So bureaucratic like view. So like that we've sort of started pushing stuff from the bottom up um, and we're now getting to the point where you guys are like in this position where you can start doing things from the top down, but it's an interesting place to be because all the talent here is came from the inside, you know, no, none of the, none of the guys on this panel were just hired in after working in finance for a long time and then came in to, Hey, what's this army thing about? Um, so I think it's a little unique in that sense. I don't know. What do you guys think? I think we're finally getting enough internal talent that allows us to effectively leverage external talent. So like one of our deployed locations um, has had a deployed one or more deployed data scientists now for about a year and a half. Um, and about, I don't know, six, eight months ago, uh, there was kind of an emerging threat and the, the sergeant major in charge of the base walks into his data science team and says, hey, I've got all these sensors that various R&D uh, organizations have, have given me. And I had a nightmare last night that if someone called and said, there's $10 million, which one do you want more of? He's like, I couldn't answer that question because the way I report these events is with email and a spreadsheet. Can you guys help with that? And for us, that was kind of a watershed moment, right? That the, the tactical operator was recognizing that, that the cost to his force protection of the status quo was too high. So by having um, analysis at the fingertips of the operator and just starting to help with daily life, it, it really has motivated um, the change to where now the operator is driving the innovation in a lot, in a lot of cases. Um, through the kind of, as that team has matured and, and multiple personalities have rotated through there, we've started to um, contract talent from industry. So these, these folks kind of snap link into that team with, I mean, it's almost funny, you know, like they, they look like they come straight from a, you know, whatever, like the stereotypical developer uh, comic strip. Um, but because they have that uniformed data scientist who maybe isn't as current in industry and, and you know, some of our skills kind of atrophy once we're in DOD because of the lack of access to tools and so forth. But having that kind of middleman expertise has allowed us to leverage maybe more current, less experienced talent more effectively. And I do want to, uh, I guess, chime in on the on the politics thing. That it, uh, you kind of got to dive in. In the DoD, there's lots of policy, um, and sometimes it can be restrictive. Whether it's it's IT policy, whether it's other types of policy that are impacting data, data sharing, and otherwise. And so, uh, just yesterday, we were trying to work through a problem that's been on a forefront of mind policy-wise for the last five years. And we were, I was able to work with a, a, a tremendous leader who's finally been able to at least make some progress on getting to this area where we need to leverage 
data science. We all know we need to leverage data science in this area, but policy has been extremely re restrictive. And so uh, the, this this leader dove into it and, and fully understood the policy, the, the spirit of the laws that are out there and tried to develop ways that we can leverage things that we're not a perfect solution yet, but we're getting at it in ways that we know we need to in ways that the American public believes that we are working toward this, this solution in, in one critical area that we have. So um, I would say in the DOD, there's tons of policy that, that impact the data science effort. Um, you do have to fully understand the, that and, and then begin to work through it and understanding the, you know, the, the, the intent of our leaders, the spirit of that intent, the spirit of the American people and trying to tackle some of this stuff, particularly with, with data um, and other things. I'm sorry to keep talking, but I'm, I'm going to jump on Dave's comment w one second. Um, I, we've done a poor job at kind of the farther you get from mission, the way we decompose risk, right? So the folks who advise senior leaders and write policy in terms of our computational security risk it's not often that they really have to balance that against the operational risk that's incurred by, by imposing this policy. So we actually had, I think 90 minutes, uh, a handful of us with the NSC's AI commission two weeks ago. And, and one of the takeaways that they're gonna go back um, to the president with is in the Department of Defense, we have to really relook um, how we address risk with things like CICD and authority to operate on networks and, you know, all, all these things that are really crippling our ability to, to learn. So we are out of time. Um, apologies if we didn't get to your question. It seems like a handful of questions we didn't get to. If you feel strongly about these, please email me and I will pass them on to the panelists. Uh, my email is rdelfine at cmu.edu. That's r-d-e-l-f-i-n-e at cmu.edu. And I'm happy to, um, to share with the panel. Ian, Dave, Matthew, Isaac, and Ian, really appreciate your, your time taking out uh, some of your busy schedules to be with us today. All the attendees who were able to, to join us today, thank you for coming. There will be an email follow-up to this session with a recording of it, so stay tuned for that. And we look forward to seeing you at our next Four Alumni by Alumni. And uh, everybody have a great afternoon. Good seeing you here today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.